Butterflies are just day-flying moths, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about moths, but it's really uh, many of the same messages. It is a bit of a conundrum, what's going on. It, you've heard multiple speakers not be able to identify what's causing the collapse of these insects, and it's pretty phenomenal that we have so many scientists looking at this problem and yet uh, are not exactly certain what the stressors are and uh, what their relative roles are. I don't have much time. I think what I want to do is just mostly lay out a puzzle in terms of the data that's been collected for moths and let you think about what might be the problem and maybe what we could do and uh, what stressors deserve the most attention. But we're going to look basically at where this is happening and, and the rates and then uh, look at when moths started declining in various places and uh, maybe which lineages or guilds are in trouble. I don't think I'll be able to get to all parts of my talk. I think moths represent a really good data set in the sense that they're ecologically quite diverse relative to many of the groups where we have less data. They're about 19 times more diverse than butterflies. Uh, their taxonomy is pretty good, and they represent just a huge range of ecologies or natural histories, uh, including some unusual things like lichen feeders and fungal feeders. Maybe most importantly, 85% are specialists, which means they perceive the world in a very fine-grained fashion. Um, this is the, the first big study that came out in 2006, and this was by Conrad, but note that Martin was also a second author on this study. And uh, what's really important here, and there's some very good information, is this steady decline of about 1 to 2 percent per year uh, across the United Kingdom or Great Britain. Uh, and so this is very hard to detect. So many of you may or not uh, may believe or may not believe in, in uh, insect decline, but it's almost impossible to perceive uh, over a human lifetime if you have rates of only one to two percent a year, but have huge fluctuations in population numbers from generation to generation or, or year to year. It's a very hard problem. But uh, most importantly here, not all species are declining in Europe. So about two-thirds are declining and one-third are increasing. Um, at least for this data set in, in Great Britain. And another really important point about this graph is that the rate of decline differs geographically. So in northern England, you have actually increasing abundances in this paper, uh, but the southern part where there's more anthropogenic stressors, you actually have a much higher rate of decline. So the average is 1 to 2 percent, but the most important message here is that it's not uniform. This is a recent data set from the Netherlands. It's basically that same rate of decline that I just mentioned, uh, 1 to 2 percent. But we now have reports from Finland, Germany, Ireland, Sweden. And note that almost all the data that we, we have that's really credible is from uh, Western and Northern Europe. And um, we really don't have much data from elsewhere. If you're trying to think about why these insects are declining and try to identify stresses in your own mind, I think it's useful to, to think about the timeline. Just about all these quantitative data sets that we have are really only starting around 1970. Well, what the heck was happening before 1970? And so we can do that with moths, um, at, at least to a much greater extent. Um, you can argue that the world's longest running insect population database is the Rothamsted Light Trap Network. Uh, currently, it runs about 80 traps uh, all throughout the UK and Ireland, uh, standardized traps, standardized bulbs. Again, volunteers playing a, a huge role in this data set. This is an example. Look at the tremendous fluctuations from year to year in individual species. It's um, very, very hard to get a feel for insects um, and whether or not they're declining with this kind of interannual fluctuation. This is a new uh, study that just came out a month ago. Very, very important in the sense that um, it's a long-term study set that goes back to, to 1965. It's based on the Rothamsted insect survey data. And note that biomass, uh, this is biomass of noctuid moths, uh, geometrid moths, and arebids the three largest groups of moths, but it actually increased up until 1982 and has been then falling off uh, for um, the last 30 years or so, 40 years or so. But um, what's really important here is that the dates that you pick uh, to compare would give you a very different answer. If you only started collecting data after 1982, 
you would have a lot different answer about the rate of biomass decline uh, within Great Britain. Overall, since 1965, if that were your starting point, you would have an increase in uh, moth biomass. We'll come back to that. Uh, there's not much data that goes back deeper, but the person who started uh, the trap design and this monitoring was C.B. Williams. Uh, he started his uh, initial samples at Rothamsted back in 1930. He ran for five years, uh, did a similar comparison in 1960, and already in, in, uh, in this much earlier period than, say, when we were using pesticides or uh, at least using neonics or some, uh, some of the other problems, we already have a 70% decline over 25 years. Um, we have much deeper data sets for butterflies that go back in time, and this is a, a recent paper that came out uh, for uh, bu butterflies and at least one group of moths um, in, in southwestern Germany. And this goes back uh, to 1750. The green line shows you the average rate of decline, but uh, you can also break it up into sort of uh, 1956 and data points in red uh, prior to 1956 and data points after 1956. But this is post-World War II. This is when we start getting organic pesticides. This is when we start getting tractors, those big tractors, uh, to um, plow up more of the land, uh, put more land into agriculture. Uh, and this would be the time when we're moving away from small family farms maybe to commercial farms. Uh, John Christian Hobel uh, came up with these three stressors, agricultural intensification, atmospheric deposition of nitrogen, and pesticides prim primarily driving this. But the decline has been happening for a very long time, which speaks more to habitat loss or increasing human densities. I'm going to skip this slide and just get to the punchline here. Um, there are groups that are decreasing and groups that are increasing, and uh, dietary specialists, as Warren had pointed out, are taking a hit. Uh, they're definitely declining faster than dietary generalists, and species in uh, low nitrogen communities such as bogs and oligotrophic grasslands doing poorly. Austral taxa, he talked about uh, southern species moving northward, and dispersive species. So maybe this biomass decline that I spoke about from Rothamsted includes a lot of pest species. That's something we need to know. Uh, uh, this is very uh, interesting. Maybe the most important data slide that I can share with you, and this is the same uh, meta-analysis of the Rothamsted trap data recently that uh, came out. And it divided those Rothamsted traps into four different habitat types. It looked at moth catches in urban situations, moth catches from woodland habitats, moth catches from semi-natural grasslands, and then grasslands or, that were in agriculture, arable lands. And what's really important here is that the, 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 the lines are basically uh, quite similar in terms of their slope upward to this 1982 inflection point and then downward. This argues very strongly against any local stressor when you're looking at different habitats. And uh, McGregor et al. Uh, concluded, and I, I see that this graph is very compelling, that it would have to be some sort of ex external stressor or force uh, acting on the whole of UK across different habitat types to explain this. And uh, the, the thing that they identified was climate, uh, particularly droughts had a huge effect on the overall situation. We have very little data for moths uh, from the neotropics. You've already heard uh, uh, Dan's presentation. It was pretty frightening. And um, Matt referred to Lee Dyer's data set, but Lee has some very nice quantitative data going back 25 years, uh, primarily for La Selva, and uh, the story is not good. It's a 40% reduction in caterpillars over the uh, 20 years, and uh, so um, Matt showed you three of the genera, but there's uh, 40 or 50 genera uh, where they're showing a decline. So all the uh, genera to the left of the dotted vertical line are declining, and some, of course, are, are increasing. There's always winners and losers, except for in, in Germany, at Krefeld, it uh, looks very, very desperate there. But usually you would expect uh, some winners and losers in, in, under mo most circumstances. Um, uh, this is actually uh, Bob Marquis's data for uh, Missouri, uh, south, I, I believe, uh, southeastern Missouri. And he has not found, in 20 years of looking at leaf-chewing insects, any decline in the uh, the caterpillars and other leaf-chewing insects. On white oak, uh, he independently looked at uh, Quercus uh, uh, black, what 
what was, uh, Bob, what was the other oak? Black uh, Velutina. And again, uh, saw no real decrease in the last 20 years. So that's encouraging. So again, there's geographic variation that's very important. Um, some more bad news. This is the forest that Matt uh, talked about where, where the beetle declined. Uh, this is Hubbard Brook. There's absolutely no pesticides here, no light pollution, no agricultural intensification. Uh, and uh, a couple weeks ago, this paper came out, 80% beetle decline in that forest. The moth data, the caterpillar data is being analyzed now. It's not a pretty picture. Uh, it's probably, probably on the order of 70% decline in a pristine New England forest. Um, I don't have time to talk about using uh, vertebrates as a uh, well, maybe I do. I have, I've just been given five minutes. So uh, I, I think uh, uh, vertebrate insectivores uh, offer really important proxy data for looking at this. Again, that gets back to Bob Marcus's question. Uh, but they don't have these year-to-year -year fluctuations. You can go out and just measure a bird census and, and have some idea about how that species is doing. M much deeper historical data. Uh, they forage across entire seasons, which is a point that Martin Sorg met, that we are made, that we need to have data from entire seasons. And they integrate data over years. So aerial insectivores, especially nightjar swallows, swifts, uh, are among the most rapidly declining birds in Europe and northeastern North America. But again, I must emphasize that's not true of the entire nation in, in the US anyway. They are declining in certain areas and not others. Um, overall, there's a rather modest uh, evidence at this point that insect feeding lineages of birds are really declining faster than other uh, kinds of birds. And we can get at that by looking at the paper that came out in Science that was pretty horrific three weeks ago, that, uh, talking about the loss in, in the US and Canada of uh, 2.9 billion birds have uh, disappeared uh, since the 1970 census. Uh, but you can look at the declines and you can see um, uh, grain feeding birds, uh, aquatic birds, uh, uh, declining uh, basically at, at some of the same rates as the insectivores. And we have some insectivores like gnat catchers and uh, vireos actually increasing since the 1970s. So it's a complicated picture. Uh, the bats, uh, also a complicated picture, Mexican free tail bats. Um, this one cave in Austin, Texas has 20 million bats. Every night those bats fly out, particularly when they're lactating, and harvest about uh, 20,000 pounds of moths a night. It's ridiculous. Uh, but um, that, that colony, at least the Bracken Cave Colony, has been steady for a couple decades. So it suggests that there hasn't been a catastrophic collapse, at least in Texas. But I will say, because it's complicated, that Mexican free-tailed bat colonies in other areas in New Mexico are not doing so well. And uh, bats move between roosts. So um, I, I do know that in certain places like England, if you build more roosts, and in Florida right now, you build more roosts, you get more bats. So I don't know what this all means. Uh, so some of the key points that I can sort of glean is that uh, at least moths seem to be declining at one to one to two percent per year in many of these studies. Uh, there's important spatial patterns uh, that argue both for low, uh, argue, argue for and against local forcings. Many declines are not synced to pesticide use. Uh, some are, but uh, some aren't. No obvious single cause. Uh, habitat loss, especially to agriculture. Uh, climate change for sure uh, seems to be playing a role in some of these agricultural intensification with pesticides. But there are other stressors. You've al already heard about nitrification, light pollution, exotic species, car strikes, and um, I don't like this, but uh, it, it looks a lot like death by a thousand cuts, and that's why we're having so much trouble uh, identifying individual stressors. Uh, some species are increasing in temperate areas, insectivorous bird and bat numbers declining, but without a strong uh, uh, insect link or signal. But we desperately need, and I think most of the people here would agree, we need better longitudinal demographic data, especially for the tropics, and especially across stressor gradients, so we can identify who the major uh, players are and what their role is in this decline. Thanks. Thank you.